So we're going to keep going down that road of, of kind of making richer and richer models and thinking about more and more different factors in a more careful way, less mechanical way, a way that involves more choice and, and like sort of real economics. Okay. So um, we'll do that. Uh, a lot. Yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff it's kind of long-term growth that we're thinking about here. So did, what, how did technology change? Why does it change? What are the incentives involved? Um, a little bit of a weird time to do that. Now things are all of a sudden seem very sudden. Our discount rates may be going up. We're thinking more about the, the present and the near future. Um, but also it's a time that technology is important. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about people talking about developing vaccines and stuff like that, that's technology. And that we can think about that with these tools. Um, okay, this is, things are pretty urgent now. So maybe, you know, market tools are not the only tools in the game. Uh, but we can we can think about those issues and think about what could happen going forward. We can think about how did we end up here and stuff like that. So um, if we want, I mean, I know that you know, it's, it's a stressful time, so maybe we'd rather just kind of do more abstract stuff. But but I think also it's good to engage uh, with this stuff a little bit. Um, okay, so all right, so so let's switch over to the notes. Okay, so this is. Here we have uh, the class notes. That's not the first slide. Okay, it's first slide. Here's lecture four, uh, economics of ideas. Okay, um, so this, uh, you know, essentially what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start out um, with a with a kind of intermediate step. Okay, which is called semi endogenous growth. Okay, I think. It, I can't remember if I, I I probably talked about it um, in some in some. Uh, capacity last time, but I think given it's been so long, it seems like it's been like a year since we, we left school, uh, probably good to backtrack a little bit. Um, and it sort of fits in with everything that we're doing. So I'm going to, I'm going to err on that side of caution. Okay. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're endogenizing technology. Okay. So before when we would, when we would have like the solo model, okay, we, um, you know, has some production function, y equals k to the alpha, al to the one minus alpha, okay? Um, and that a, that was technology, okay? And we, we would just assume that, um, I guess you, I can use my mouse here too, we would assume that that's uh, growing at some constant, an exogenous rate g, and that was sort of it, okay? But we know that the technology doesn't just grow on its own, it doesn't improve on its own, it, it improves because of the sort of incremental efforts of various different parties, okay? And all of that... Uh, those are sort of choices and those things take resources and there are trade-offs involved between today and then in the future. And um, it's important to kind of think about that carefully, okay, especially in the modern era. Okay, um, so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to think about the different forces and that, that might shape this, okay? Um, so, the, so the first pass, okay, is what's called semi-endogenous growth, okay, as opposed to the fully endogenous growth that we'll go to in the future, okay? Um, and that, uh, you know, you have, um, what we're going to do is, is in, introduce what I, or what we call a, a production function for new ideas. Okay. So what we're saying, this is kind of like that, you know, the solo law of motion in the sense where they're saying, okay, the rate of change of a, of technology or of like the stock of, of new ideas is equal to some function. Okay. So we're saying the, the, the derivative of a, the rate of change of a over time how much it's going up over time is going to be equal to this function. Okay. And what's going on with this function is what it basically takes two inputs. It takes a, which is the existing level of technology and it takes R, which is the amount of research effort that we're putting in. Now R, I'm not being specific about what R is right now. Okay. It could be like, you know, some goods or anything like that. It could be labor, like researchers, it could be capital of some sort. So I'm being a little bit abstract but some measure of R, okay? So those are the two inputs and, and the, the gamma, phi, and eta are, are sort of parameters that determine those. Uh, symbol f uh, question, is the symbol before A, uh, under just kind of that, so the, this symbol is, that's gamma, okay? Um, yeah, so we're, we're gonna, if you, if you don't, uh, we're gonna be introducing some new Greek letters and uh, when I was an undergrad, I, basically, I didn't know them. It's sort of, sort of the thing you pick up in grad school, but let's let's start now. Uh, gamma, so this is gamma. It's a little kind of a weird font. It's got phi, and then we got eta. Okay, and that's just a 
that's just a constant. Okay, so all that's doing, all that gamma is doing is just controlling kind of the level, how productive uh, things are in terms of producing ideas. Okay, um, and that's that's not going to be changing over time. Okay, so 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 that's that's kind of the level, and then the phi and uh, eta, these two th these two um, attached uh, these two exponents here are controlling how important uh, each of those inputs are a and, and r okay um, and then uh, yeah and also a side note like in the in the macro in the in, sorry in the graduate uh, lecture this morning like um, okay we got a, we got another question so where you could zoom over that equation and see okay uh, yeah I can do that I can actually what's the best way to do this I can zoom the whole thing. That's not actually zooming anything. Uh, let me see. I can do it in my streaming thing. Uh, let me a moment to figure out how to do that. Hello, I want to zoom stretch to screen. No, that did, didn't quite do what we want. Got like a ton of different transformations here. Let's see. I want to make this larger. Uh, is that if not? It's, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me let me give let me give this a, a shot, and then if if I don't succeed, then um, then we can we can try something else. If you're, are, I don't know if, if people are on desktops or mobile phones. Um, I think it's for the math stuff. It's probably better to be on a desktop. Uh, uh, a friend of mine was was checking out like a test stream on the mobile, and it, it's just it's a little hard with the math to to make it out. Okay, um, but I'll I'll look into that um, in the future. See if I can. I, I there, there are ways I can kind of reorient stuff um, to to hopefully make that better. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll look into that. Okay, um, but then also uh, yeah. So in the in the in the grad class this morning, um, sort of like you know because you know I can't see you. Uh, you know the the general cycle for a question was like. Okay, I have a question, I'll see it hopefully within two seconds, answer it, and then it's like kind of just gonna be like, cool, thanks, or whatever. If if don't don't hesitate if you if you just want to say, okay, yeah, that that's good to give like a another reply to say, okay, we can we can move on. Or if you, if it's not good, you know, say, well, actually what I'm I'm still a bit confused. Okay, so don't don't worry about kind of being chatty. Um that's 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 I think what we gotta do. Okay. So um Okay, so, all right, so then, yeah, there's phi um, and uh, the eta, they, they control the importance of, of each of these inputs. Okay, so phi is going to control how important existing technology is in making new technology. Okay, so we know that that clearly you need to, there, there's kind of two things going on here. One is you need, you need to kind of go in an order. I mean, if you want to invent calculus you need to know about like algebra or basic math first okay and if you want to invent special relativity relativity you need calculus or whatever things need to go in order and you, you build on what you do in the future okay so that's one thing the other thing is that that's on a that's on an ideas level the other thing is a more of like a technological level i mean you 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 use existing technology to produce technology new technology in the sense of like we use computers to like com to you know uh compute like how does this protein fold and you know uh how can we use that in medicine so it's like you actually directly use existing technology it's not just that you're inspired by it um so there's a, there's kind of two at least two channels through which you can think about this working okay but what but that phi is just sort of combining all those and saying like how much do we need uh old technology to produce new technology okay um and then r is uh R is pretty standard. It's just saying you put in a certain amount of, let's say, researchers, and you get out some product. Okay, that's like a regular production function. And eta, which you would think is is between zero and one to make it a concave function, eta controls how how many how much decreasing returns you have. Okay, so it's not going to be the case necessarily that if you double the number of researchers, you're going to get twice as many ideas. Okay, um, and the rationale for that is that you know imagine you had one team working on stuff and they were doing their thing, trying to develop some new technology. And you're like, okay, we're, we're going to double our scale. Okay, we're going to have two teams. And let's say that they don't perfectly communicate between the two teams. They might do duplicative stuff, right? They might work on the same thing. They might try the same thing. And if that's the case, you know, that duplication means that their total output is going to be less than double of their 
uh, the original output. Okay. Um, so, so that's sort of like what's called like stepping on each other's toes. Like you're, you're kind of duplicating, um, people doing, um, you could think of other stuff once you go to sort of a more market setting where people, um, you know, they're worried that they're going to get scooped by their competitors and maybe they do more or less research. Okay. But, but here you can think about just duplicative research as being a thing that arises from imperfect communication between everyone that's doing research as you get a bigger and bigger society, the informational constraints get larger and larger. So you, you think there's, there's, there's certainly going to be some concavity there. Um, yeah, so so those are sort of the, the intuitive arguments for for those things. Now, so eta definitely should be should be less than one. It should be between zero and one because it's just a regular concave production function. Um, phi is not necessarily clear. I mean, it, you know, you could see one, you could see less than one, maybe greater than one. So we're going to investigate phi. It should be positive. It should be the case that having better technology today at least doesn't make you worse off in producing new technology in the future. Okay, so we're going to at least say it's positive. Whether it's greater or less than one, we're going to leave open and we're going to try and kind of reverse engineer and say, okay, well, if it was greater than one, what would happen? If it was equal to one, what would happen? If it was less, and then kind of intuitively try to figure out what's the most reasonable case. All right. Um, okay, so then... Okay, so that's those. Those are sort of our two parameters. If you want to think about like you know the Cobb Douglas production function, we have alpha, alpha, you know you have k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha, alpha and one minus alpha control how important each of those. Anytime you have these exponents, they're controlling how important each of those inputs is for production. Same thing here, just they don't happen to add to one. They're just it's, we're we're being a little bit more flexible here. Okay, all right, um, excellent. Okay, so. Um, I've got this issue with like fractions not working. Okay, now they work. Um, okay, so uh, now what can we do with this? Well, if you want to, uh, you know, the, the previous equation was thinking about things in terms of levels. Okay, uh, you can also think about it in terms of of growth rates. Okay, so if you want, like. So let's 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 fire up the whiteboard. Okay, so I got this this like stylus thing in the whiteboard. So I, let's train. Let's let's use that. Uh, here we go. Um, okay, so so like uh, so this is like Jones. Okay, the handwriting. You know my handwriting was never very good on the board, but it's it's a little bit worse on uh, on the the stylus. Okay, but but essentially that production function we were looking at it was a dot equals gamma a to the phi. And then r to the eta. Okay, so um, so that's our production function. If we want to turn that into a growth rate equation, okay, then we just say, okay, well, g, we're defining g to be the growth rate of a over a. So that's going to be you know gamma. Now this is going to be phi minus one here. R is, is the same. Okay. Now, kind of we're you know, spoiler alert, we're going to kind of think about phi for now as being less than one. Okay. And then we'll, we'll move on to other stuff, other assumptions later, but think about, we're kind of, it, it doesn't really matter, but we're thinking about phi as being less than one. And so, you know, this is, this is, would be a negative exponent. So it makes more sense to put it uh, in the denominator was my old office mate used to call it downstairs uh, and make it a one minus phi. Okay. So you got gamma r to the eight on top and then a to the one minus five on the bottom. So just moving into the bottom, we invert that. So now this is divided by a to some positive power. You know, it's like the square root of a or something like that. Okay. So, um, so that'll get you to the growth rate expression. Okay. So I'm going to kind of jump back and forth between the slides and the uh, uh, whiteboard. Okay. So that's, that's, and that expression is exactly what we have there. Okay. Um, and, and so the intuition here is, okay, we're, we're kind of thinking like, we want to end up in a place where growth is roughly constant. Okay. So, you know, that's what we see in the modern era. Technology um, grows about 2% a year. It's pretty darn consistent. Um, so that's kind of what we we're looking for. And if you wanted to get that, then, you know, he, he, this, this growth expression should be some kind of constant. Okay. Now what, what we see with that a in the denominator um, is that uh, essentially Having you know more advanced technology in the growth rate sense actually does kind of make sustaining future growth more difficult. Okay, it's not that it's bad. I mean, it, it is still good, but if you do, if you look at things proportionally, 
okay then it's it's not so good okay and and uh I guess you guys are getting a lot of exposure. We're all getting a lot of exposure to logarithmic graphs. Now we're looking at all this epi epidemiological stuff and you're thinking about log plots. So maybe that, whatever that before was, was actually useful. But here it's sort of like the same kind of thing. It's like, you know, the, the slope's still going up, but but in sort of proportional terms, it's it, there, there's there's a sense in which having better technology reduces future growth rate. Okay, and what is that, what's the intuition for that? Well, it's just that, you know, it's harder to improve technology if you're starting from a higher baseline, you know? So there have been people before us that have done great things, come up with amazing ideas. And so if you come around today and it's like, well, I can't just do that old stuff. I got to come up with something new and even better. Okay. So it's sort of like people get the low hanging fruit and then, uh, to, to advance technology, you have to do even better. You have to use even more resources and things like that. Okay. So, and you, you see that, um, in science, you see that in, in technology, that you, you need to throw more resources. Like nowadays you need to have like supercomputers, you need to have big, you know, huge teams. Like if you look at LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, the paper they published had 300 authors, you know, the whole thing was a massive industrial collaboration just to, to, to launch two particles into one another in such a way that you see the, the Higgs boson or whatever. Okay, so, um, you know, it gets, it gets more and more difficult, okay? And so, that's that's the intuition for seeing a into the denominator there is that that proportionately speaking it gets more difficult okay um, and if if you didn't change anything about R if you just had the same number of scientists okay then you would see a decreasing growth rate over time okay and again that's essentially if you look in the news it's like that's what you want to see that's what we're seeing in Korea for this epidemiological stuff you see a decreasing growth rate because things are slowing down okay so you would see that if you didn't increase R uh at all okay so but but we want to we want to see a constant growth rate in this case we want to have constant technological growth okay so to, to to counteract that you need to continually increase r which is what i'm saying at the bottom of the slide here you need to have commensurate increases in r to counteract the fact that it gets more and more difficult to generate new ideas over time okay um okay uh and we can do that all right, and we're gonna we're gonna basically do that and figure out what the the implications are for that. Okay, now um, the question is, well, what is what is R? Why is it growing? We need to be a little bit more specific uh, about that. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna say is that R we're gonna say R is actually labor. It's researchers out there. Okay, so in truth, um, the research process is you you require uh labor you require kind of capital in the form of equipment machines devices and things like that and you need materials uh and, and um you know like chemical materials lab materials those pyrex things whatever so um you know you need kind of a bunch of stuff but we're gonna say you know a lot of it in fact the majority of the costs that come from researchers because it turns out you have to pay researchers a lot of money um and so we're gonna just say that for now that these are just researchers okay so the, the basic assumption we're going to make is that um, some constant fraction here, I'm going to call it S, which is this, it's the same as we used for solo. It's a different meaning, though. It's sort of, it's like investment. It's just investment in terms of people, okay? You're, you're taking a certain fraction of people and, and having them be researchers. Everyone else produces goods, okay? So it's still an investment consumption trade-off. It's just in terms of research and production, okay? So we're going to say at any given time, you know, 5% of the population is researchers, okay? That's I don't know. That's actually probably a little high. I think it's more about two. It's more like two point five percent. So at any given time, you know, five percent of the population is researchers. Population is growing though. Okay, so we're going to get growth in researchers as well. And in fact, we know that you know if, if R is like five percent of L, uh, and L is growing at some rate n, right? Then in fact R is going to grow at the exact same rate, right? So so anytime two things are proportional they're going to have the same growth rate. Okay, so so once you think about things proportionally, in fact, the researchers are also going to be growing at rate n. Okay, so um, so let's let's kind of work that out. So here, I'm just saying, uh, you know, take that equation we had for, for growth, and instead of where we had r, we're going to have s times l. Okay, so that's that's just our, that's, that's the fraction there. Um, and then we can think about, well, what, what would we need for there to be constant growth? Okay. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Well, we can just use our laws of 
growth rates. Okay, so we know that, um, I mean, there's two ways you can think about this particular operation. One is, uh, you know, the growth rate of this whole thing should be zero, which is to say that the growth rate of the top minus the growth rate of the bottom should be zero, which is to say that the growth rate of the top and the bottom should be the same. Okay, so I mean, that's kind of intuitive. If you have a ratio and you want it to be constant, the top and the bottom should be growing at the same rate. Okay, so that's step one, is that the top and the bottom should grow at the same rate. What's the growth rate at the top? Well, that's going to be, let's see, so gammas, that's a constant. S is a constant. The only thing that's changing is L. So L to the eta is our, our growth rate, there's our value that's changing on the top, and that's going to have a growth rate of eta times that growth rate of L, which is which is going to be N, but we'll just leave it as GL for here. That's the growth rate at the top. The growth rate at the bottom is just 1 minus 5 times the growth rate of A. So that's that power law for growth rates, saying a to the 1 minus phi is going to grow at 1 minus phi times the growth rate of A. Okay, so this is just using those laws of growth rates. Now, we know that um, GL is equal to N. We're assuming that's like our standard assumption that the population is growing, L is growing at rate N. Um, it's a little funky here because in this font, eta looks really similar to N, but just eta's got the tail. Um, and then on the right, I, I'm going to, anytime we have technology, I just call that G. So, in, you know, GA is, is just defined to be G. Okay, I'm just dropping the A. Okay. Um, all right, now that gives us an equation. And in this equation, we're looking for G. We know phi, eta, and n. These are all parameters that we sort of just know. Okay. And so we can just divide and say that, that G, that, that sort of equilibrium G is going to be eta times n over 1 minus phi. Okay, so, so what we did is said, okay, we want to figure out when we have constant growth. To do that, what the problem with that is that as a as technology gets better, achieving constant growth gets more difficult. And so you need to put in more resources to, to counteract that. And so you need to have balance between the increase in the research effort and the fact that research is getting more difficult over time. Um, and that's what this equation does. And then that'll give you a certain g because you know your research your your research resources are going up and there's a certain g where that is perfectly counterbalanced with the fact that research is getting more difficult okay and that g is a to n divided by one minus phi okay um so yeah and so so there's a couple implications of of this result okay that are that are kind of important okay uh really two Okay, so the um, so the first one is 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 the relationship between growth and uh, and population growth. Okay, and actually, it's kind of interesting because it's sort of in some sense the opposite of Malthus, right? So with Malthus, we found that uh, if you have population growth, things get really bad, and essentially you can't have population growth. Okay, uh, here we're finding if you want things to get better, you need to have population growth. Okay, so it's kind of interesting as a as a uh, counterpoint to Malthus. Okay, where once we introduce technology. Okay, um, so that's no, number one is that you you need and so the reason you need population growth is that if you didn't, you, research would get more difficult and you'd eventually kind of peter out and just stagnate. Okay, so you need population growth to generate these new ideas. Um, that's number one. Um, and then number two is that actually that fraction, that S researcher fraction doesn't affect long-term growth. And that's a little surprising because usually people think, especially in like policy circles, they're like, okay, let's have a R and D subsidy or a tax credit and firms will do more R and D, which means that goes up and, uh, then growth will go up. And according to this, that's not true because you put in, um, you, you know, you, you, you kind of push things a little bit harder. You, 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 you maybe temporarily increase the number of researchers, but then because research gets even harder over time, then that, that denominator pulls you back down to the same level G. Okay. And you can see in this, um, in this equation here, there is no S in G star. The long run growth rate is not a function of S. Okay. So if you change S, nothing's going to happen to this. All right. And we'll see in the short run, that's not true. Okay. But, but in the long run, that, that is, going to be true. Okay. So, um, then yeah. So those are the two big applications. Those are kind of number two, especially was surprising to people when this came out, this was in like in the nineties. Um, I think people, yeah, that was sort of made a big splash. Okay. 
um, because it, it ran contrary to the way that they had been thinking about innovation and, and research. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's sort of the big. Those are the big results for, for and that, that relies on phi being less than one. Okay. So so it, what it's saying is that yeah, um, past technology is important in producing new technology, but it's not too important. It's not, and it's it's in that range where you still have this dynamic where if if there's been a lot of progress made before, to make even more progress is more difficult over time. Okay, so uh, that's what phi being between zero and one means. Um, you can push it up to phi equals one and say, okay, well, what if phi is exactly equal to one? Okay, so this is called uh, what's called a knife edge case. That's something that people, I mean, they say that in economics and sometimes I think in physics or fine tuning, they would call it in physics, uh, which is that, you know, phi, phi equals one is, is a very particular number. If you drew phi randomly from some distribution, the chances of getting one exactly is infinitesimally small. Okay, so it's a very particular point, And if you go on either side, things are very different. And so there's reason to be a little bit suspicious that you would actually see phi precisely equal to one in the real world okay um but it's and it's it's an interesting case nonetheless to look at okay um so what if you assume phi equals one okay so okay so so take, remember that original equation was a oops that's wrong that's unfortunate okay this this should be an a dot here okay this should be a dot equals um i guess i could fix that but frankly i don't yeah we don't have time so um a dot equals gamma a now usually we'd have to the phi here that's now one so just a and then r to the eta that's the same okay so this if phi equals one this is what our production function is here with the with the derivative sign here okay and then we would divide by a move that over down here we get g equals a dot over a this is now correct a dot over a would be just gamma times r to the eta and if we assume again that r is some fraction of the population it's gamma s l to the eta okay so now you can see that that g because kind of a perfectly cancels out when you go to the growth rate that g is influenced by s now if you if you do have an r d subsidy and firms do more research s goes up then g is going to go up as well permanently okay so you do get sort of that usual thing that people would have thought um would happen if you're at this very particular phi equals one case okay so there is some hope but it's sort of like you need to be in the exact right spot okay so um now uh this changes things okay so in terms of the relationship between growth of technology and growth of population is now actually a little bit problematic to have population growth. Because if you look at this growth equation again, g is equal to gamma s l to the eta. And the l is growing exponentially over time. That's pretty much what's happening with people in the world. Okay. Um, now, if l is growing exponentially here, that means that g itself is growing exponentially. When you have a growth rate growing exponentially, that's usually a bad thing. Things are going to blow up. Okay. So um, if you had population growth in this phi equals one case, then you get a very what's called counterfactual result or incorrect, like vis-a-vis -vis the data result, uh, that growth is accelerating like super rapidly, um, which we, we really just do not see that. We see constant growth, okay? In the 20th century and 21st so far. Um, okay, so that's one problem. Uh, now, and then the, the, the other one is not a problem, okay? Uh, it's, it's just a result, which I mentioned, which is that, that that result about S is overturned in the sense that now if you change how many researchers you have as a fraction of the population, that will influence growth. Okay. Um, now that can also be a little bit problematic because if you look at, you know, different countries and different states at various times have had uh, different research subsidies uh, or tax credits. Okay. So in the U.S., the way they do it is that if you do some research, as you're a firm, you do some research, uh, and you can deduct that. So you, you you make a certain amount of profits on which you have to pay a corporate tax rate of I don't know what it's thirty five percent I think. Um, if you do, but if you're doing research, you can deduct that uh, from your profits, and so you don't have to. 
pay taxes on that. Um, and so it's, it's effectively like a subsidy. Okay. Um, so, so for each bit of research you do, you get like 20% back or something like that. Okay. Um, and so that, that encourages firms to do relatively more research. Okay. And then the question is, does that influence growth? Um, it's not clear empirically. People have looked at it. Um, you know, if you look at like different states having different rates and seeing do the states with higher rates grow faster, you don't really see that much. Okay. Now it's a difficult analysis because all the states are also interacting with each other. It's not just like each state is an island. So that's, that complicates things. Um, but um, yeah, it's the, the results are not super strong there. So, so even he, empirically, we don't see so much a number two, okay? Which is another reason maybe to doubt this five equals one case, okay? Um, yeah, so, you know, um, that's, but, but the sort of the overarching thing then I guess is that you kind of would expect some phi between zero and one, okay? You would expect some sense in which as technology gets more advanced, it gets more and more difficult to come up with a genuinely new idea, okay? Um, all right, so there's another case which we alluded to, which I alluded to, uh, we haven't gone over yet, which is um, the phi greater than one case. Now, things get pretty wacky here uh, in the phi greater than one case. I'll, I'll show you what happens, uh, but it's not like, th this is more of just a curiosity, let me say in the next slide, than, than anything that we need to worry about, okay? Um, okay, so what happens if phi is greater than one? Okay, so again, we're back to uh, our production function. This is the same thing now, some general phi, but now we're thinking about phi being greater than one. If you calculate the growth rate, no, so now I'm just gonna leave it like this. So before I moved to the bottom, but now since phi is thought to be greater than one, we're gonna leave it like this. So now you do, you have better technology that's gonna increase your growth in the future rather than making it more difficult. So you could kind of like, this is well, the reason I'm calling the singularity cases like this, like you, you know, you get like AI and it's smart and it can do its own research. And so you just get this like cycle, right? So that's kind of what I'm thinking here that that would cause phi to be greater than one. Okay. Um, okay. So then what, what would that imply? Okay. So, so first um, we can, uh, we can write this out. Okay. And, and, the question is, what would that imply? So let me let me hop over to the, the uh, whiteboard here uh, and think about the case where phi is greater than one. Okay, case where phi is greater than one. Okay, so here. Okay, so we're gonna have g. I got is equal to eight out of our a, which is gamma. A to the five minus one are to the eta. Okay. Um, okay, and so then kind of as A gets larger, then you're gonna see continual increases in A. Okay, so one thing you can do is so we kind of want to know what's gonna happen to the growth rate given this sort of compounding dynamic. Okay. So one thing you can do is uh, take the growth rate of the growth rate, which is kind of what we did before, okay? But we're gonna do it a little bit more formally here. Um, you can say, okay, what's the growth rate of the growth rate? Okay, and by the way, the growth rate of the growth rate would be like g dot over g. So how is the growth rate changing? Divided by the growth rate itself, okay? So um, what's that gonna be? So we just take the growth rate of this expression, okay? So we've done that before, it's like in Cobb-Douglas. Take the growth rate of some multiplied expression, there you go. So gamma, that's a constant. The first thing is going to give you one minus phi. Sorry, that's, that should be phi minus one. Use the old eraser here. Uh, phi minus one times g a, which is really just g. So let's just cut to the chase and say that's g. Uh, plus uh, eta times g l or g r, which we're just going to say is n. Okay, so that's just going to be the population growth rate. Okay, so this is um, this is what you would get. All right. So now what? And, and so you can see that like kind of like if <clears throat> you know g is positive and gets larger, that means the growth rate of g gets larger as well. So you get this. You see the same sort of 
things are going to get out of control dynamic. There's compounding going on. Okay. Um, and you can actually uh, solve exactly what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, if, if, if you make a one assumption. Okay. So, so what this is saying is, this is saying, you know, G dot is equal to G. If you, if you move this G over, it's equal to G times five minus one times G plus eta times n. Okay, so this is this is like a law of motion for g here. Okay, saying how g, how does g move around given a certain value for g. Um, so that that's all you know. Anytime we write these laws of motion, you know these are this is also a differential equation describing how g evolves. And usually it's kind of just like we haven't engaged with that so much, but you, you know you can you can solve these in general, uh, or sorry, you can solve them in very specific cases, not in general. Okay, so so. Uh, in this case, if we assume, let's just say that there's no population growth rate, that that population is constant. Okay, this is like a lower bound. Okay, if population was growing, what I'm going to say here would get even more extreme. Okay, so this is like a lower bound on what what might happen. Okay, so if n equals zero, if we look at this over here, that that means that this term is going to drop out. So we're just left with what we're left with g dot is equal to what phi minus one times you know, g, g, g squared. Okay, so that's going to be g squared. Okay, so phi minus one uh, a times g squared. Okay. Um, all right, and so we can solve this actually. Okay. Uh, this is this is a little bit of a, a sideshow, but we're going to do it nonetheless because it's kind of funny. Um, so uh, what does this mean? So what is g dot? That's the derivative of g, right? That's dg. Dt. Usually we can just leave it g dot, but we actually need to kind of think about it separately in this case. Phi minus one g squared. So the, the derivative of g is equal to phi minus one times g squared. Okay, bear with me here. And that means we're gonna like cheat a little bit. Um, this is like yeah, this, this is make like Leibniz or Newton roll over in their grave, but we're gonna cheat a little bit and like move the dt over. Okay, normally you're not supposed to do that, but like we're we're being wild here. Okay, so we're going to keep this dg here. We're going to move that g squared over here too. We're moving the g squared over here and we're moving the dt to the other side. Okay, don't tell your math or stats professors about this. Okay, so um, we've now reorganized this in a sort of way where the g stuff is all on this side and the t stuff is all on this side. Okay, and it turns out, I'm going to jump down here on the left, um, we can just integrate both sides. Okay. We're going to integrate both sides. We can do that. And uh, oh, I forgot, I need to scroll so I don't accidentally draw behind my own head. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so we're going to integrate this side. We know we know how to integrate that. We're going to integrate this side and we just need a constant of integration uh, to, to make things kind of add up. Okay, so what happens if you integrate one over g squared? Well, it turns out that you get minus one over g, okay? Right, because if you if you were to take the derivative of this, you'd get minus one times one over g squared, which with this extra minus would give you one over g squared dg. Okay, so that's just integrating it. Okay, and then integrate the right side. We're going to get phi minus one. So that's just a constant. We're going to get phi minus one times t, and then we need the constant of integration. Okay, so sorry, I, this is like a plus sign here. That's a t. Okay. Let's see. And this, this, this is like g of t. This is a function. Okay. Okay. So now we're we're actually in pretty good shape. Okay. We just need to take that sort of leap there, and and we just need to solve this for g of t now. Okay. Um. And we need to figure out the constant of integration. Okay. So we need to do those two things. Now the constant of integration. Um, that's not so bad, okay? Because what what determines that? Well, essentially, it's like our initial condition, okay? So, um, what does that mean? Okay, so our our initial condition is that you know g zero, g at time zero is equal to some initial value, g sub zero. Okay, so let's say we just start today and we have two percent growth. So all we're saying is at time equals zero, we should have that two percent growth, okay? Um, and what does that mean? Well, that means that 
minus one over g of zero should be equal to, well, this is just zero, okay? And then this is c, okay? So that's our initial condition gives us c, okay? Um, and this, so it's saying that c, that constant of integration should be minus one over g of zero. So what that does is it guarantees that where we start is consistent with like what our data says that we start at 2% growth, okay? So, and now we can plug that in that, that C, okay? So minus one over G of T is equal to five minus one of T minus, so now we're plugging in C, one over G of zero, okay? So now this is an equation where kind of, we, we all we have to do now is solve for G of T, kind of like subtract, add, invert things. And then we're going to be able to, to get a function g of t equals something. Okay, I actually really, you know, okay, it doesn't, this is not important, but you know, the way I wrote it, this should be g sub zero. Okay, it's the same thing as g of zero, but it's like, it's more like a number sub zero. Okay, all right, so now we can just solve this for g of t and we're going to get a thing. We're going to get a function for g. Um, Okay, so first, multiply everything by minus one. That gives you uh, one over g zero minus five minus one times t. Okay, now we're almost there. We just need to invert this multiplicatively. And we get g of t is equal to one over that whole thing on the right side, one over one over g zero minus Five minus one times t. Okay, that's a function. You know, that's it's it's a function of t. We kind of know all the stuff inside. If you want, you can you can write g zero. You can multiply top and bottom by g zero. You get one minus g zero five minus one t. So I just multiplied the top and the bottom by t, by g zero to make it look nicer. Okay. All right. So that's G of T. Okay, this thing here is our G of T. This tells us, given that we started G zero, how do we evolve over time? Okay, and so as T goes up, this thing's gonna get closer to one, and then because we're inverting it, it's actually gonna go up. So what it's gonna look like is, uh, you know what? I have a ruler tool that I can draw stuff with. What it's gonna look like is, this. Uh, so we'll start at g zero times zero, and then it's going to go like it's actually more than exponential because it it asymptotes to infinity at a finite time. Okay, so this is like some t star. It's going to go to infinity. So what does that mean? When this thing, when t gets large enough, eventually this denominator becomes zero, which means that's where we hit the asymptote. Okay, so when one is equal to g zero, five minus one times t, then things get wacky. We, we hit that asymptote and that means if you solve for t, that's like t star is equal to one over g zero times five minus one, okay? So this is saying growth is, because you have this compounding effect where better technology makes more future growth even easier, you get this compounding effect, okay? Uh, and it actually produces a, a, an asymptote, okay, at a finite time, where you get infinite growth, okay. And so, like, let's say let's say we use some like so-called data here, uh, and said that g zero is like two percent, and let's just say five is two, some number greater than one, okay. What does that imply here? That means that t star, okay. So if five is two, this thing here is one, okay. So it's just one over g zero. So one over two percent is one over 0.2 is 50 years. So this is saying like growth accelerates and then at, at t equals 50 years, you achieve this singularity of insane growth and so on. Okay, so um, that's that's the derivation. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, that would be cool, kind of, it would be kind of dangerous, but um, I don't think it's gonna happen. It doesn't look like it's happening now. Um, uh, but that's what would happen if I was greater than one. So, so what I take away from that exercise is that probably phi is not greater than one. Okay, probably 
wherein the either phi equals one or phi less than one, more likely case. Okay. Um, so, but but it's important because you know, phi, I mean, phi is in some sense the most important parameter in this whole thing. Is 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 how does past technology help you uh, improve technology in the future? Okay, it's a big question. And it's not obvious what the answer is. Okay, uh, but we're at least saying probably reasonable to go with phi less than one. Okay. Um, all right. So. Okay. So that that this slide is just summarizing that and and kind of noting that maybe we should we should rule out phi being greater than one. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. And so then the last thing. Um, the last thing I'll say is, is about this long run. So we were talking just all that stuff was about the long run, right? So that's saying, where do we end up? If we make a certain change, we kind of let everything equilibrate and then say, where do we end up uh, after a while? Okay. In the short run, that's not necessarily true. Okay. In the short run, we're going to get kind of dynamics that look kind of reminiscent of how Malthus looks is like you get some deviation, but you always have to go back to, to, to that growth rate of G or in the case of Malthus to that uh, standard of living of theta or whatever. Okay. So, um, or like C, C bar or whatever we called it. So, uh, so it's going to be kind of like that. Okay. So, um, let's see, what, what did I include here in that? So, but essentially, um, there's, there's a couple different ways you can think about it. Okay. So one way is, uh, uh, if you look at this equation here, like if you kind of bump up R, let's say you increased S, your, your research fraction, you kind of bump up R, then in the short run, I mean, it must be that growth goes up because A is kind of like capital. It's in the short run, it's fixed. And if you just increase R arbitrarily one day, it must be that G goes up, right? Now what happens then? So you increase R and you do it permanently. Okay, so this this numerator goes up. Now, because growth is higher, A is going to go up faster, right? Which means that that's going to push growth back down over time. And eventually, you're going to return it exactly back to G star. So, um, you know, if you want to, uh, let's see. So let's, let's, let's do the whiteboard. If you want to think about it um, graphically, so... You know, G is equal to gamma R to the eta or A to the one minus phi. And then you know you want to think about it like S L to the eta, A to the one minus phi. Okay, so this is like a new thing here. Um so so what we're thinking about is S goes to some S prime that's greater than S. You increase uh the the fraction of people that you're devoting to research, okay, um, that's going to push up this denominator, okay? And then if you want to think about um, what that'll look like, okay, so we need, yeah, um, I guess, I guess growth, growth not going to go negative in this case, but uh, so we can just draw like this. Um, what we're going to see is, so let's say that, uh, this is that G star. Oops, I'm still in ruler mode. Uh, so this is that G star. Okay, so that's kind of like where we start. And then this is where our change happens. So this is like T0. Okay, uh, what we're saying is, okay, so first of all, if, if nothing happened, let's approximate a straight line here, we'd keep going like that. But something did happen. We, we increased the research share. Okay, so we're going to jump up in the short run to some higher value. But then over time, A is going to get larger, even relative to uh, this SL term. OK, and what we're going to do is kind of slowly converge back in some sort of asymptotic way. OK, well, you know, we won't go below, but we'll kind of converge there. OK, so it's going to look like a lot of other kind of these. these oops, you probably want to see that instead of not seeing it. Um, it's going to look like a lot of other graphs. Okay, so there we go. Um, that we've seen like sort of like returning to, to the original steady state. Okay, because because in the end, G star. Uh, who is what's up, Ray Queen? Um, I don't know who you are. You might be a student. 
You might not be. Um, but you're excited. Uh, and that's good. So uh, this is going to be G star is going to be A to N uh, over 1 minus phi. OK. Um, all right, so then, uh, yeah, so it's not going to be affected by S is the, is the important part, OK? Um, so now, uh, the other way you can think about this is actually what I had previously. Where did it go? When we thought about this this growth rate, OK? So uh, so the, this approach that we took, we can also take that here. So if we think about um, the growth rate of G, Okay, g dot over g. From here, you know, that's going to be eta times the growth rate of r, which is n, minus 1 minus phi times g. So it's going to be eta times the growth rate of r, which is the population growth rate, minus 1 minus phi times the growth rate of a, which is g. So that's, that's this equation here. Okay, and so here you can see the sort of usual dynamics, a lot of hype going on there. Uh, you can see the usual dynamics um, where and if G is relatively low, okay, let's say G was super low, it was like zero, you'd see G dot being positive. If G was relatively high, then G dot would be negative, okay? So that's a stability notion, okay? Um, now, uh, yeah, so you're gonna return back to that original value regardless of happens. So this is, so is kind of standard, you know, it's just like Malthus. We have a steady state. It's not influenced by S. Things are stable. We're going to return back to where we started. Okay, so that's that's kind of the intuition there. Okay, now let's head back to the slides. So so that you know in the end you, you get something reasonable. You have this long run prediction. Things move around in the short run, but not too much. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll I'll skip over this. Okay, so so that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, with regards to say like this Jones, what I'm calling the Jones taxonomy of, of how to think about these things in a semi-endogenous way. And the reason it's semi-endogenous is we still have that sort of solo style assumption that you just put a certain fraction of people in the research and that's it. Okay. That's still kind of boring in some sense. Um, let's see. Ray Queen. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, to address this. Hold on one second. Um, okay, well, I'll just ignore it. It's fine. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so so if you have, uh, if you, if you want to get a little bit more sophisticated, okay, then we need to, we need to unpack things a little bit. All right, so um, what can we do? Well, so essentially, we're gonna, this is going to be more of like a descriptive sort of semi-empirical parts. So we're not we're not gonna do too much too much more math. Um, what we're gonna do is is and this this is stuff that is is covered in, in the Jones book as well. Okay, so this is like shoot, I forgot which chapter it is. Let me tell you though, because I have a book right here. Um, okay, so go past the solo stuff. Engine of growth. This is like this chapter five. This seems like kind of chapter five. Um, no, chapter four. Okay, so so this is like chapter four. This is like kind of the conceptual overview. Okay, so this is gonna be, we're gonna be doing chapter four and chapter five for a good bit here. Okay, so um, essentially uh, what we're gonna do is 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 give you, kind of give you a conceptual overview of like why, why are ideas different, okay? Um, so in the idea that, that we're gonna push forth here is that you know you can think about ideas as goods, okay, um, and you can think about them as stuff that you sort of you buy, you can sell, you know, uh, you produce, you it costs money to produce them and things like that. Okay, so there's a sense in which you can think about them as goods, okay, um, but they're also kind of different. Okay, they don't have the same properties that regular goods have. Most goods have the property that they're their the rival risk is what what Jones calls it. Okay, so if I consume a certain amount of good, then you can't consume that. Okay, so I got some coffee here, right? If I drink this coffee, you can't drink it. Okay, um, that's called rivalry. Okay, so ideas necessarily don't necessarily have that property. Okay, um, 
in the in the in the sense of like if you know it depends how you think about an idea if you think about an idea as a technique a technology for doing something a way to approach something you know if you adapt that technique i can adapt that technique it's it's not really a big deal right so so in that sense they're not really like goods because there's nothing preventing multiple people from using them at the same time okay so that like traditional goods um Okay, and so that and that that's kind of closely linked to sort of this notion of like duplication. Okay, so if you um, think about instead of techniques and technologies and stuff like that, if, instead you think about like um, movies, music, any of the, the sort of content is what we would call it nowadays. Uh, that I mean, it takes some resources to duplicate that less and less over time it used to be at records which are somewhat costly but not so much cds and so on now it's just uh digital so it's, it's like almost free so so it's closely linked to the the concept of duplication costs as well okay even with an idea you at least have to say it out loud to communicate it to other other people okay and sometimes ideas are hard to adapt it's not like you can say oh i know a calculus now let's let's use it um it's costly to to learn that okay so um okay uh are they somewhat like public goods? Yeah, so they, they are. Um, so let's see. So, so you know, they're, they're going to be a lot like public goods, and especially because we're going to start talking about externalities in a second. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you come up with an idea, then, and it just, it gets, word gets out about this new way to like do something, or to, to produce something, okay? It's like a public good in the sense that, um, in the sense that mul you know, multiple people can use it, so like a park or something like that uh and it's it's what and the next thing i'll introduce okay which is on the next slide uh is is excludability is that it's it's difficult to exclude people from using these ideas okay so so and that there again you get like it's like a park i mean you got or a forest or something it's like um unless you do something extreme you know people can just kind of walk in and hang out okay but you get in, in a park or forest you do get a little bit of congestion which is another thing, sort of the tragedy of the commons or something like that. You get congestion wherein, you know, I use this place and that kind of negatively inf influences other people. Um, but yeah, they are a lot like public goods, okay? Um, and so, so, but then, so if you think about this excludability property, the ability to prevent other people from using it, okay? So, I mean, on one hand, it's like, well, why, why would you want to do that? I mean, we're just, don't be a jerk. Let, let other people use the thing that you, you made. It's not going to hurt you. Okay. And that makes sense. Um, but, but on the other hand, if you think about the incentives, okay, I mean, usually we want some uh, sort of matching uh, between the benefits of something and the costs. Okay. So, and, and kind of like what, what excludability gives you is, is the ability to charge people money when they benefit from something. So you have a forest, it's nice. I come in there and take it over and make a gate and charge people money to enter. That's not really a nice thing to do in my opinion, but let's say I do it. Okay, so there I'm, I'm uh, there I'm just kind of, uh, that, that has no apparent social value because like I'm, I'm just sort of requisitioning that land, okay? But if you thought about like a different situation where like you actually had to do some investment to, uh, to, to discover something, then maybe it makes sense. Okay, so like I come up with, let's say, I don't, we don't have to use me. Let's say one of you guys comes up with a new idea um, and it's great for society. Everyone's, everyone can use it in principle. And so things are great and you don't really get that much. Okay, so because you didn't, you, know, you, don't, you don't have a patent on it or anything and you know, that doesn't happen. So you, you're, you're, you don't really internalize any of that benefit. Okay, so if you think about this as like an investment, you do some investment to come up with a new idea it could potentially benefit a lot of people. The incentives aren't really that good in that setting because you did something that benefited a lot of people. And then, so, you know, you come up with some new idea and you want to, you would think you want to have those incentives be internalized, right? So if, if the incentives are internalized, then you can, uh, you would expect to achieve, achieve a more efficient allocation or more like efficient outcome. Okay. So if, if, if instead you had a situation where you guys come up with a new idea, let's say it's a good idea and people are going to benefit from it, you patent it so that um, other people can't 
necessarily use it. And then let's say it's like a production thing. You patent it and you make some new products with it and everyone's happy. Okay, so there you would think you've now internalized a lot of the benefits from that, okay? And like, it's kind of, you know, people have to pay for it now, okay? So in some sense, that, that's costly to them, okay? But uh, the probability of you have of, of you doing that sort of investment, that research to come up with a new idea may go up because you're now internalizing those those benefits. Okay. So it's it's a little counterintuitive in some sense, but like you, you know, at the end of the day, like there are trade-offs, okay, and we want to incentivize people to to make costly investments. Okay. And so that's a case where you, you might you might think that having a patent system helps. Okay. Where there's a costly investment and people aren't necessarily going to make that investment unless they get compensated. Okay. Sometimes there's cases where people are just like, you know what, I'm going to do this and it's going to benefit people and I would have done it anyway. And that's a case where you don't need incentives because it's all, you know, they, their their own sort of, you know, feeling of, of improving society is enough, but that's not always the case. So uh, there's certainly cases where, where a patent is, is more appropriate. Okay, so that's kind of the that's kind of the direction that we're going, thinking about these incentives. Okay, and what we're going to do is um, think about uh, how we can make sort of like a parsimonious model to, to capture this sort of stuff.